Well, hello again, my friends. Thanks for joining me as we look at another Old Testament name for God. Today we're looking at the name Jehovah Shammah, which means the Lord is there. It's only found one time in the Bible, and that's the very last verse in Ezekiel's prophecy. Ezekiel chapter 48 and verse 35, and it says, All the way around shall be 18,000 cubits, and the name of the city from that day shall be the Lord is there, Jehovah Shammah. So you see, it's actually the name that will be given to the city of Jerusalem during the millennial reign of Christ, which is still yet to come. But the name will also extend into the eternal kingdom because God will eventually forever be in his holy city with his people. It signifies that God will keep his covenant promises to the nation of Israel despite the judgment that they were facing at the time. But it also reveals a reality for every Christian, and that is that Jehovah our God is always with us. He is always there. Jehovah was first present with his people after they were delivered from slavery in Egypt. He manifested his presence through the Shekinah glory. You may remember as a huge pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, he instructed Moses to build a tabernacle where he would reside with them. That word tabernacle meant dwelling place. So God's Shekinah glory was actually the visible evidence that Jehovah was there with his people. And God's glory also filled Solomon's temple when it was completed. You can read about that in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. His glory would rest between the two cherubim on top of the Ark of the Covenant, which was housed behind this thick veil in the Holy of Holies. That was the place where no man could go except the high priest one day a year on the Day of Atonement, and he would go to make an atonement for the sins of the people. Now, Ezekiel was a priest, and he was a prophet who warned the people about the departure of God's glory and his judgment. But his ministry took place primarily after Jerusalem had been conquered by Babylon. In 605 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar began his conquest of Jerusalem, and he took many captives. Among them was a young man named Daniel. In 597 BC came another siege. This time he took captive King Jehoiachin and another group of 10,000 Jews this time, Ezekiel was among this group. And then the final destruction of Jerusalem came in 586 B.C., and Solomon's beautiful temple was completely destroyed. But God's presence had already departed from Jerusalem, from the holy place in the temple, and from the people of Israel. But sadly, long before this took place, Israel had left Jehovah. Their hearts were far from him. Over time, they had lost their reverence for God. Their worship became more of an empty form rather than a heartfelt expression of worship. They began to look at the pagan world around them with all of its sinful pleasures and forbidden gods. They became rebellious and idolatrous, and they failed to follow the Sabbath laws for giving rest to the land every seven years. And so they incited Jehovah's wrath, and he used this pagan nation of Babylon to judge his people, and Jerusalem was destroyed, and the people were exiled for 70 years. But Jehovah's punishment was not a means to an end. It was to bring his people to a state of repentance and humility before their God. They would eventually be allowed to go back and rebuild, but God's glory had left. But now Ezekiel also saw in the far distant future to the day when Jehovah would restore Israel and fulfill all of his promises made to them. That well-known picture of dry bones being made to live in Ezekiel chapter 37 reveals that one day in the future, God will bring revival and restoration and he resurrects this nation. He fulfills his promises and, and then he promises once again to be with them forever. In verses 26 to 28, we read these words. God says, Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. 
I will establish them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The nations also will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. Now, you know, today Israel is going through a difficult time. Right now, they're continuing to get hammered by Hamas with missiles every day, it seems. Public opinion seems to be turning against Israel because Israel is retaliating. But even if there is a ceasefire, her enemies may retract and withdraw for a time. But they're determined to see Israel annihilated. Like Bibi Netanyahu says, if the Arabs put down their weapons today, there would be no more violence. If the Jews put down their weapons today, there would be no more Israel. I'm afraid he's right. But God has given assurances in his word that the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David will eventually be fulfilled. And this name, Jehovah Shammah, is a sure reminder that one day Israel will realize that Jesus is the Messiah that they rejected 2,000 years ago. They will repent. Jehovah will restore the nation. And all of her enemies will be defeated. But that day is yet to come. It may be soon, but we don't know when. Then, as Ezekiel concludes his prophecy in chapter 48, he caps it off with the return of God's glory to the rebuilt city of Jerusalem, which will be named Jehovah Shammah. The Lord is there. Revelation 21 and verse 3 tells us that he will continue to stay there into the eternal state. It says, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And he's talking about all the redeemed people of God, Jew and Gentile, from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And so Jehovah's glory was there with Moses at the burning bush. It was there in the tabernacle after they were delivered from Egypt. It was there in Solomon's temple until he departed at the onset of the Babylonian exile. But do, do we see his glory before the end time prophecy is fulfilled? Well, yes, we do. Jehovah's glory did eventually return to Israel in the person of Jesus Christ. John chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then we read in verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt, the word literally means tabernacle, the Word dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And you remember His name was also called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. And the glory of God was there with his people for 33 years. He even referred to himself as the temple when he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will rise it up. And at the transfiguration, he gave Peter, James, and John a little foretaste of his glory. But unfortunately, the people of Israel rejected him. He came unto his own and his own received him not. He died for our sins. And just as he said, though, he rose again and he ascended to his father in heaven. So now when we think about Jehovah's glory, how is it revealed? We know it's going to be displayed in Jerusalem in the future millennium. But what about now? What about today? Well, believe it or not, loved ones, Jehovah Shammah wants to display his glory in and through you by way of your personal testimony, your personal relationship with the person of Jesus Christ. When you come to realize that you're a sinner in need of forgiveness and salvation, and you realize that your only hope is found in his mercy, you repent of your sins and you put your faith in the finished work of Christ at Calvary, then he comes and he saves you and he comes to live within you and you literally become his holy temple, his dwelling place. And Paul reminds us that because the Lord is in us, he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, 
and you are not your own, for you are bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So loved ones, that's, that's really for us a call to responsible godly living, to glorify God because he lives in us. He goes with us wherever we go. He's with us in everything we do. He sees everything we look at because he's always with us. And that's a really sobering thought. If we're really conscious of his presence, that would have a definite influence on our behavior, don't you think? But it should also encourage and strengthen us to know that he is ever with us and in us. And that when we are tempted or when we're in the midst of spiritual battle, he is there and we can stand strong in his power and in the strength of his might and not have to depend upon our own strength. This name Jehovah Shammah is a reminder for us that in our darkest hour, when, our, when we're feeling abandoned and, and hopeless even, he's still with us and, and, and he has promised that he's never going to leave us. Every genuine born-again believer can say Jehovah is here. He is with us and he has promised that he would never leave us nor forsake us. He will always be with us. And so what an encouragement, what a source of strength and comfort that is for us. And just like he promised to be there in Jerusalem forever, he will be in us forever, or with us forever. You know, I remember reading a book a long time ago when I was a brand new believer by a 17th century monk named Brother Lawrence. And the book was called Practicing the Presence of God. And we all live in the presence of God all the time. In fact, we, we cannot not live in his presence. But we can live unaware of his presence, which many of us do. But Brother Lawrence's goal was to maintain an ongoing conversation and communication with God no matter what he was doing. And I know for most of us, that's easier said than done. We get caught up in the course of everyday living. But the idea is definitely worth considering. And if we want to practice his presence, we really have to be intentional about it. We have to discipline ourselves to include God in our daily routine. And it, and it really starts with how you begin your day. It's been proven that your morning routine is going to set the tone for the rest of your day. And so rather than being stressed and rushed around beginning your, then beginning your day as you would without God, why don't you start your day with God, get up, make, day, make some time to get into his word, Make your daily prayer something like this. God, this day is from you and for you. I know that you're always with me, so use me to bring glory to your name. Loved ones, he's always with us. So let's, let's live to bring him glory, shall we? Let's pray. Jehovah Shammah, the Lord who is there, thank you for the assurance of your presence. May we be intentional about living in your presence so that we would always be mindful to tell others about salvation through faith in our great Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we pray this in his great name. Amen. Okay, friends. Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is always there. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So live your life to his honor and glory. He's promised that he'll always be there. God bless you. Lord willing, we'll see you next time. Goodbye.